This video is about canon additions to the Star Wars universe via the comics for January 2016. January saw the release of four Star Wars comics, Star Wars issue 14 and 15, Darth Vader number 15, and Kanan number 10. And we're going to go ahead and start with Star Wars issue number 14 and Darth Vader issue number 15, which make up the miniseries Vader Down part 5 and 6 respectively. If you don't remember what this Vader Down series is about, here's a quick refresher. Darth Vader has tracked down his son, the rebel pilot Luke Skywalker, and the pair ended up crashing on the planet. Han Solo, Chewie, and R2-D2 rescue Luke from Dr. Aphra and her droids Triple Zero and BT, allies of Vader, but are then attacked by a Wookiee bounty hunter. Meanwhile, Princess Leia searched for Darth Vader on the planet with other rebels. Seeing this as her chance to end Vader once and for all and get vengeance for her planet's destruction. However, Vader takes out all the pursuing rebels until Leia is left. She manages to get away, well, Vader lets her get away hoping she'll lead him to Luke, and she instead orders all surviving rebel pilots to attack with full force, which hopefully will kill Vader and most likely end her as well. As the rebels rush in, Luke also rushes to rescue Leia from their strike. But Commander Carbon has arrived with his own men, changing the fate of the rebel attack. This issue opens with Leia throwing some seriously nasty words at Vader, letting him know that everything is going to go up in flames and she is going to be there to see it. Him, the Emperor, the Empire, she is going to live to see it all destroyed. And Vader responds in his typical BAMF way. Vader lets her know that this isn't a war. War are for lesser men than the Emperor, and himself. This is a series of executions. And he lets Leia know hers is long overdue. But then Vader notices that the stormtroopers that are surrounding them aren't his own men, and that's when Commander Carbon steps forward and tells him that it won't be the end of Princess Leia today, it is going to be the end of Vader and his miserable existence. And Commander Carbon lets him know that this was all a setup. He let Vader lead him to this planet so that he can get all the, the prizes, the victories for this. So Carbon can eliminate the rebels on this planet and also get the boy Luke, who was responsible for the destruction of the Death Star and someone the Emperor really wants. And then at the same time, oh, oops, Vader died. How sad. And he can kind of worm his way to the side of the Emperor. Carbon tells his soldiers to find the boy and take the princess. But Vader has other plans and knocks down the soldiers, telling Carbon he will win no prizes today, except a quick death. And those two engage in a lightsaber fight, with Carbon wielding four lightsabers. Meanwhile, Han and Chewie are fighting the Wookiee bounty hunter, and Chewie is getting his butt absolutely handed to him because he is still weakened from the drug that was administered to him earlier by Aphra and Co. Luckily, R2-D2 gives Chewie his shot, and Chewie ends up hulking out and going after the Wookiee. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Luke is searching for Leia, but goes back to the ruined temple that is strong in the Force. There he hears Ben calling out to him. Luke tells him about finding Ben's journal on Tatooine and how he's trying to find the Jedi Temple on this planet and needs his help. But Ben ignores his request, telling him he should have never come to this place. You are not ready. Luke begs Obi-Wan to tell him how to get ready, but Ben answers, you are not ready for what is coming. If you're noticing a trend in these comics, Ben's voice usually calls out to Luke, telling him when he isn't ready or when he should run. He's a very helpful little Navi, and he is typically 100% correct, and in this case he's also correct, and shortly after Luke is surrounded by stormtroopers. They engage in a battle, and Aphra's two droids watch on in interest. Aphra tells the droids to not let the troopers take Luke and to get him instead, something the droids are very happy about as they will likely get to hurt and kill people and BT sets the troopers on fire. And this is just where everything takes a turn for the worse in the comics. So we have Han and Chewie who are now being overpowered again by the bounty hunter Wookiee. We have Luke who is being captured by the stormtroopers. We have C-3PO whose arms are torn off and he is trying to tell Leia, hey, you need to help, I am worried. Master Luke has been taken. I'm, I'm pretty sure Han and Chewie are about to die at the hands of this bounty hunter. Please, you need to help us. And Leia has in her sights Vader, who is distracted by his fight with Carbon. And Leia, as we know through the comics, is very 
goal-oriented and really wants to take down the Empire. And she has been willing to risk her friends to do that in the past and kind of brush them to the side saying they would understand this is more important than their lives. And here we see a moment where Leia has to decide between her friends or getting revenge for her planet. And in her mind, she sees the planet of Alderaan being destroyed, and we just see how much that's affecting her, and she levels the gun at Vader, but then she sees her friends dead at her feet, and she decides that her friends are worth more than this potential revenge against Vader, and she takes off to save them. Which is a really big moment in the comics for Leia, because we have seen her time after time basically the tell her friends to fuck off, Sorry, you're gonna have to deal with your own. Oh, he might be alive. Well, you know, whatever. I'm gonna go over here and take out Vader. So this actually was a really big step for Leia, in my opinion. The comic wraps up with Vader instructing Aphra to crash her ship into Carbon, killing him and ending the fight. C-3PO shocking and knocking out the Wookiee bounty hunter. The stormtroopers have Luke and are taking off the planet, but Vader senses this and destroys a part of their ship with the Force, causing it to crash back to the surface where Luke gets out and is reunited with Han, Chewie, C-3PO, and R2-D2. But Aphra is also there, informing them she has a minefield and will detonate it if they don't drop their weapons. But Leia shows up and knocks her out, saying she knows things and they can interrogate her. She tells them to get Dr. Aphra on board and broadcast a message to all rebels to get off the planet before it's too late. As they leave the planet, Luke is remorseful that he'll never get back to the temple, and he knows he was close to something. Vader watches on as they leave. So that's the end of the Vader Down miniseries. Carbon ends up dying, which I think isn't really a big deal. We knew that guy was pretty much gonna be out the door. And we got to see Vader be totally OP throughout this entire miniseries and dealing with rebel fodder, which is always fun for me. Not that I am pro empire or anything. So, and we also got a lot of progress with Leia, which is also something that I'm glad to see. So I actually really enjoyed the Vader Down series. On to Star Wars issue number 15. This gave us another story about what Obi-Wan was up to during his exile on Tatooine. And if you watched my earlier video that I released last week about Obi-Wan's exile on the planet, this is basically a repeat of what I said in that video for the second story. This story takes place one year after the last one, so nine years into his exile and one year after the drought has ended. We see Obi-Wan keeping a low profile and not venturing into town anymore, especially now that Jabba has been paying people to find the man that beat up his tax collectors. Which, if you read the first Obi-Wan story in Star Wars issue number seven, Obi-Wan was the man that beat up the tax collectors to save Luke. So it makes sense that he's staying out of town to keep that low profile. Obi-Wan continues to watch over Luke, but still isn't allowed to train him. Ben would notice Luke pilot a ship, impressing his friends, and he would remember that Anakin had been the most daring pilot he had ever seen, even as a boy. He wonders if Anakin's boy could be just as strong in the Force, which worries Kenobi, because through watching over Luke, he discovers just how much Luke is like his father. But despite this worry, Obi-Wan still encourages him from afar, telling Luke to feel the Force flow through him if he can but we see that Luke isn't quite on the same level as his father, and he ends up clipping the edge of a canyon and he destroys his ship. And we see Obi-Wan follow Luke home, and Owen is just pissed that one, Luke was flying the ship, and two, he ended up clipping it, which pretty much decommissioned it. And Owen tells Luke that as long as he lives, Luke will never fly again. Obi-Wan, however, has other plans, and since he can't go into town anymore, instead he ends up going to the Jawas, who have been victim of raids of late. Obi-Wan exchanges his services of protecting them for parts. While waiting for the raiders, Obi-Wan would express his hope for Luke, telling his master, There's still hope, master. You thought Anakin was the chosen one. Perhaps in a way he was. If his son shows the same abilities, then just maybe. He would succeed in scaring off the Tusken Raiders without a lightsaber, but getting a kink in his back from it, thinking that he shouldn't be doing stuff like this. His job was simply to protect the boy and keep him hidden, but Obi-Wan also acknowledges his own mortality. He wouldn't be around for 800 years. At one point, Luke would be on his own, and something told Kenobi that on that day, Luke would need to know how to fly. 
The next day in town, the Jawas end up giving Luke the spare parts, and Luke ends up thinking that Owen got the parts for him instead to fix the ship, and he's super excited, and we see Obi-Wan, who is watching him, smiling at his excitement, which is very cute. But Owen would have none of this, and that night he would end up visiting Obi-Wan and dumping the parts that Obi-Wan arranged to be given to Luke on his floor, telling him to stay the hell away from his family, and that Owen isn't stupid and he knows what Obi-Wan has been doing. And so he basically leaves telling Obi-Wan, keep your trouble to yourself. Nobody wants it. You're gonna end up getting people killed and telling him, haven't you killed enough Skywalkers already? After Owen leaves, Obi-Wan acknowledges he's right. He does have a hard time staying out of trouble, but he's also good at not dying. But he promises Luke will never find trouble as long as he lives. Meanwhile, Jabba has paid for a new fierce bounty hunter to find the man that ambushed his tax collectors. So kind of depressing, as was the other Obi-Wan story, but I really enjoy seeing anything we can on his exile on the planet, and seeing him watch over Luke is really heartwarming to me, so these issues are always fun and appreciated. Lastly, we have Kanan issue number 10, which is part of the First Blood series, and here's a quick reminder of what that is. It is 15 years after the defeat of the Jedi Order. Emperor Palpatine now rules the galaxy, and rebels have banded together to fight back. Among them is former Jedi Padawan Caleb, who now goes by Kanan Jars, who I will be calling Kanan for the rest of this for the sake of simplicity. Kanan is wounded while searching for his ex-partner and falls unconscious, recalling his first missions as a Padawan under Jedi Master Bilaba. During Kanan's first mission as a Padawan, he is eager to join the fray, but is hit several times by blasts and a brave clone that earns the nickname Stance stands guard over him and keeps him alive. After defeating the Separatists, the group moves to Megiddo for their next mission, but there, General Grievous is waiting for them. This issue begins in the present day, 15 years after the fall of the Jedi Order, with the rebels trying to hold off the stormtroopers because Kanan is still unconscious and needs time to recover. Meanwhile, Kanan is dreaming about his past as a Padawan under Master Bilaba. The young Padawan has healed from the blast he took, but realizes that taking those wounds helped him bond with the clone troopers. He hopes that their mission on the war-torn planet will help the battalion emerge even stronger. We see them clear the areas of battle droids, and Kanan is happy to be in the middle of war. And it turns out that they have landed in the middle of the third battle of Megiddo. And Kanan is very aware that the Republic forces are very outnumbered, and his own learning curve is dangerously steep. During the fighting, Bilaba continues to teach her Padawan, instructing him on sacrifice, telling him not all sacrifice is easy to dismiss. There will be loss, painful loss, but that must not prevent the true Jedi from taking risks, from surrendering oneself to a higher purpose. During this lesson that Bilaba is trying to teach Kanan, Kanan gets a flash, an image, a moment from the Force, and it shows him the clone troopers turning on him and his master. And he's very confused about this image he gets in his head. But before Kanan can think on it, it turns out that they walked into a trap and they are cut off from escape as droids begin to climb up to them. Bilaba calls for an extraction, but the ETA is four minutes, and Kanan questions if they have four minutes. Bilaba tells the two clone troopers in Kanan to take four quadrants and did not let them achieve the summit. When they appear to be overwhelmed, Skull Squadron comes to the rescue. Their extraction comes, and Kanan questions how the Separatists found them. It seemed they were ready for them. Bilaba agrees it is odd, and the attack was elaborate. They land at the base camp and are taken by surprise again by their enemies, and here Stance is killed. Kanan embraces the dead trooper, and a cage warrior tells him he's next. Bilaba starts to go to Kanan when General Grievous shows up. So good issue, I'm always excited about seeing more Clone War stories, especially after the cancellation of the amazing TV series. I should have seen it from a mile away that Stance was going to die because they were too buddy-buddy, him and Kanan were just having too many cute moments, and even seeing him bond with the troopers, it's all just there to dig that knife in because we all know what's going to happen. So that was a little bit of a bummer, Stance dying. 
Happy to see Bilba growing more confident in herself, especially since this was a woman a few issues ago that was talking about how she was damaged goods and worried that she was never going to be an asset again. So I'm enjoying seeing her become more confident in herself, and I am super excited for the battle between her and Grievous next issue because you know it's going to be super emotional since he was responsible for her 90% losses with her last command and her ending up in a coma and you know he's going to dig that in and just taunt the hell out of her about it. So that was Star Wars canon via the comics for January 2016. Make sure you like and subscribe, come back every week for new Star Wars videos, Game of Thrones videos, comic videos, and more.